Thy word is strength. Thy word is power. Lord, your word is Thy force. Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Hi, and welcome to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. We're just blessed that you can join us and be with us. Too bad you're not here physically. We'd love to have that, but we thank God for the technology that allows us to reach you wherever you are from where we are. So greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we continue in our study in Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians. So before we start this evening, I'm going to ask Brother Mark again to to start us off and ask God's blessing on our time together. Well, Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to meet together and to get into your word. Just let us receive it in our hearts and we carry it with us throughout this week and throughout the rest of our little lives. Let it have an, Im an impact to change our lives. Amen. Amen. Well, this is our 10th chapter in our study of this study in First Thessalonians. It's our 10th part. 10th part. Because we're only in chapter 4. That's just maybe a little confusing. When you say it is now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Your right. chapters and their chapters are not the same. All righty then. So in any event, this is our 10th part of the study. Um, we're, we'll be starting tonight in the fourth chapter, the first verse of the fourth chapter. And before we do, I just want to remind you that uh, we're talking about a period of time, and we'll see this as we go along through the study, that was far more religious than the world we live in today. Now, a lot of people have been just kind of, they, they've come to an opinion that's erroneous, that we live in a world that's very, very religious. Uh, well, the fact of the matter is, in Paul's time, in the ancient world, going back 2,000 years ago, it was far more religious. To find somebody that didn't believe in God, or a God, back then, was very, very uncommon, where it has become very, very common today. And that's kind of a result of, uh, you know, the devil has worked very hard at this, uh, and... You know, when America was founded from the British colonies, they believed, many of the founding fathers believed in God, but they believed in a God, and they were very vague about the God they believed in. And rather than so much creating freedom for religion, well, they created freedom for whatever you want to do with religion, and that, that's a fact. Whereas that belief was restricted in different areas, as it still is in many areas today. But in the mid-1800s, it was Karl Marx, the founder of communism, who said that religion is the opiate of the masses. And that was kind of a, the beginning of a real effort to make re people free, quote-unquote, free from religion, so that they didn't have to hold to any religious belief at all. And communism, you know, for many years when I was young, it was called godless communism. And indeed, it was or it probably still is godless communism. Um, but here in the West, we've done our part to make Christianity irrelevant. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit. You know, to, to believe that there is a God, but then say he doesn't really play a part in your life, is, is that better than saying there is no God? Uh, neither, neither is good. So we'll, we'll talk about that. But we'll start off now, as I said, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 to start off tonight. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. So Paul is encouraging this church. Now remember, if you've been with us in the earlier studies, that in the book of Acts, it talks about how Paul went to Thessalonica, was there for three weeks, was giving instruction, and then was driven out of town by, by oppressive Jews who refused to accept the Messiah or Jesus as their promised Messiah. Uh, but in that very brief time, Paul had an incredible impact. And this church is based and built 
upon the foundation that he laid in that three weeks, all right? Uh, so now he's saying, he's instructed them how to please God. Pleasing God is an important thing. Yes. You know, we did a study here at Bible Talk that went on for the better part, I guess, probably close to nine months, where what we were seeking was to find out how to please God by doing a study of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Because in there, he talks, the Lord writing to these churches talks about the things that he commends that please him and the things that he condemns that displease him. All right? So it should be our desire to please God. It's all about pleasing God. Our lives are about pleasing God. It's all about him, not about us. It's all, well, and, and therein, I want to, I want to, I want you to get this that I say right now, right? Because as I was praying for this time tonight, it just struck me when we talk about pleasing God. Pride will keep you pleased with yourself right where you are. Humility will move you to pursue that upward calling that brings you from glory to glory. So pride gets you stuck where you are. Humility drives you forward on that upward calling of God, right? And, and that leads to being in a place where you will receive the commandments we gave you, that Paul says, right? Because you can only receive his commandments in humility. In humility, right? Right. And part of the reason for that is this. And here's part of the problem that we're facing in the world today, and quite frankly, in the church today. This is the issue of mentoring versus discipling. Now, you know, I mean, Alice and I have the opportunity. We've traveled all over. I mean, we've traveled. I've preached this gospel on five different continents, and we've met with churches all over the world. And I find that the term mentoring has kind of replaced the term discipling in the church. Too bad. Too bad indeed. Mm. So if you may not be conscious of this fact. But the word mentor is actually a name. It's a name that comes from Greek mythology. Mentor is a character, a man, in Greek mythology. He was entrusted by Odysseus, who was the king of Ithaca, to instruct and advise his son, Telemachus, when, when Odysseus went off to war, the Trojan War. See, so when he goes off to a war that lasted 10 years, by the way, the Trojan War, he takes mentor and makes him an advisor to his son. And that's the key. A mentor is an advisor. Right? Now, his son was in charge of the kingdom when the king was away. Well, he's in charge of what's left behind, yes. Right. To, to maintain what's, well, Odysseus is off at the war, yes. Right. right. But a mentor gives advice to the recipient, to his recipients. And the recipient can take it or leave it. Because then, then the, the recipients of advice are free to accept or reject it, right? It's like, you know, if you go for advice or, for whatever it is, you know, come tax season, you go get tax advice, you may take it, but you're not, there's no obligation for you to take advice, all right? And that's what's going on, that's what mentoring is about. It's the giving of advice, and the recipient of that advice has the choice of taking it or not taking it. Take it or leave it. Take it or leave it. In discipleship, discipleship is a relationship with a master who gives commandments to a disciple, right? And those commandments demand obedience. Because he has authority. Because it is a matter of authority, right? So let me read you this verse from Matthew 28. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 20, 28, right? So he's saying, you know, go out and make disciples, teaching them what they are commanded to do. This is not a book of suggestions. This is not, although there is good advice on how to live your life, this is not a book of advice. 
You see, because this is the word of God. All scripture is God breathed. Paul wrote to Timothy in first in Second Timothy chapter three, right? God, what he speaks is a command. What Jesus spoke is a command because he has been given all authority. This is why we call him Lord. You know, you've heard me, if you've been here at all with us before, you've heard me say that the most important thing I've ever learned in 35 years of, of doing this thing in my relationship with Jesus is that Jesus is Lord and I'm not. Lord means somebody that has authority over you. So he's not a mentor giving advice. He's giving commandments. Commandments that are to be obeyed. You know, we don't do enough teaching, I don't believe, on obedience in the church. No. And, uh, well, that's, that's a whole subject. I don't want to go off on that. But, you know, we are called to obey, to hear and obey the voice of God. And I hear a lot of teaching on faith, and I'll just leave it at this. If you go to that, that faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, that father of faith, Abraham, it says, by faith, Abraham obeyed. Faith gives you the power to obey. So, okay. And the Hebrew word Shema, Shema. is the same. The, the Hebrew word Shema is the, the Hebrew word to hear. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the Hebrew word Shema is the Hebrew word to obey. The, the word for hear and obey is exactly the same word in Hebrew. Why? Because it is, it is not, I mean, when God speaks, it is assumed that you will obey. Right? How could you not? Well, you certainly should. You certainly should. Well, right? the track record of humans obeying are, is not oh, that great. No. And by the way, you know, to obey is better than sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And when you're not obeying, what you are doing is rebelling. You are rebelling against the authority of God. And rebellion is as witchcraft. A lot of witchcraft going on today. Okay. So let me go on. First Thessalonians 4, verses 3 to 7. Let me read those. For this is the will of God. Your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion, like the Gentiles, who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things. Just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. Now, sanctification is holiness. Yes. Okay, they come. That's the same, basically the same word coming from that. You know, and it says in Hebrews twelve fourteen, pursue peace with all men and the holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Okay, holiness is not something. Again, we we focus on a lot in the body of Christ today. There are these holiness, quote unquote, holiness churches. But I, I'm, but you, no, just thinking about that, that you, how could you expect to see God in anything other than holiness? You'd never be able to see him in anything unless it's holy. He is holy, and yes. Because he is holy. And we are to be holy. Exactly. Okay? All right, and that's what Paul is talking about. Okay? This is the instruction that he gave him, the sanctification. That's what we should be seeking is the sanctification. And Paul here is talking about sexual impurity, staying away from sexual impurity. Now... We live in a, in a world where it's like, it's like a sewer. I mean, you can't turn on television here in the United States, any place in the West that I know of, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Europe. It is just, you are bombarded with sexual filth. Windows. And by the way, sexuality is not filth. No, no. There's a, there's a right way. By the, the devil didn't invent sex. No. It was God. It started this thing when he said to Adam and Eve, you know, that you're to Before be fruitful and multiply. And multiply. Mm -hmm. This is his idea. But there's a right way. And then there is the perversion of the devil. Okay? Mm -hmm. What you're seeing in our world today is that perversion. When I start talking about sexual impurity, and we don't, again, I don't know that we do a lot of talking in the church today about sexual impurity other than when churches are standing there pointing the finger outside the doors of the church and condemning the world. Well, you want to know, this is Paul's instruction to the church, yeah. to the believers. And the believers are not getting enough teaching on sanctification in sexual matters. But now, right off the bat, here's where the difficulty comes in. And this is why I started tonight by saying that they live in a much more religious world than we do. All right? 
when I start talking about, let's just call it pornography, just to, to deal with it. That's, let me just, and this is not, you know, a dictionary definition, but I'm just for working. I'm going to use this as a working definition. Mm-hmm. Pornography is all sexual activity outside the will of God. Okay? What you don't get today, what's hard for us to understand, what is difficult, almost to the point of impossibility to understand, is that when Paul is talking about sexual impurity, he is talking about a spiritual thing. Because the religions of his day, the pagan religions, were filled with sexual impurity. Okay, that was part of their religious practice, virtually always. Now, that, that was the great attraction. Or well, one that's, of the great that's, that's part of the attraction. Because, you know, the devil can only appeal to the flesh. He doesn't appeal to the spirit. And one of the basis fleshly desires is, you know, sexual relations. Okay, that's a fact. You know, we're mature here. Let's, let's deal with this as it is. And so the devil has used his sexual attraction to draw men into his fold since the beginning. How far from the beginning? Well, there was a, a Greek writer, Herodotus, who was called the father of history. Now, he lived like in the mid the 5th century, 450 BC. And he wrote, his famous work was called The Histories. And he literally writ, wrote a history of the kingdoms prior to the time he lived, right? Now remember, this is this is being written in 450 BC. And he starts writing about the Babylonian Empire. Now, during the time where he's alive, it's the Persian Empire that has has succeeded the the Babylonian Empire. But he's writing and in writing about the Babylonian Empire, uh, he talks about the fact that every woman in the Babylonian Empire had to participate in sexual intercourse with a stranger in the temple of Aphrodite at least once in her life as an act of temple prostitution. That was part of their religion. Okay? This is, I'm, I really want to spend a little time and, and help you to see this clearly because it's so important in this day and age. And not to get ahead of myself here, but why is it so important? Because in the book of Revelation, in the ninth chapter, the Lord talks about the fact that there will be two things that mankind will not repent of in the last days. Pornography and drugs. Right? So it is very, very important. And when you, and I, when you begin to understand the spiritual significance of this, the fact that the devil tries to draw men is just part of religious. This is this is a religious worship. Mm-hmm. Sexual activity outside of God's will is still today a religious practice, just the wrong religion. Okay. The pagan religions, the word Gentile in the New Testament is the same as the word pagan. All right. Because what it, what it means, generally speaking, all right, Paul will apply it as to believers who were of, you know, Gentile heritage. But what it means is you're not a Jew. Anybody that was not a Jew, as is today, is a Gentile, a goy, goyim, right? The Jews are the family of God, the people of God, the tribes, right? Now we've been adopted. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've been adopted. You've been grafted into that, that branch. But when it's talking about pagans who are not believers, it's talking about pagans, all right? It's just it's people who are not not part of the body of Christ, all right? This is the instruction that God wrote. Now remember, Babylon. Babel starts with the tower in the book of Genesis, way way back, right? After that, in the law, the Torah. In Deuteronomy 23, verses 17 and 18, I'm going to read you from the King James. It says, There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor sodomite of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore, I'll be skip, into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow. 
Both of these are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Right? So it says that, that no daughter of Israel shall be a whore. And that the wages of whore shall not be brought in to the temple. Got that? Yes. All right. Here's what's interesting about that statement in Deuteronomy. In verse 17, the word, the Hebrew word for whore is kadesh, which is, root, the root of that is from the Hebrew word for consecrated, because it's talking about a temple prostitute, a religious prostitute. Okay? Mm -hmm. The second word in verse 18, whore, is zona, which just means what you understand as a whore today, a prostitute today. So right there in Deuteronomy, thousands of years ago, they're making a distinction between a, a religious prostitute, temple prostitute, somebody, a woman who is used in sexual activity in a religious setting. They're making that distinction way back in Deuteronomy. Now, I want to just name four principles. At the time that Paul was writing this letter to the Thessalonians, I want to give you four principal goddesses. They're basically all the same, pagan goddesses, under different names. Right? It's very common in the different empires, in different mythology and everything, that these goddesses and gods had different names that refer to the same person. Right? Mm -hmm. But it starts with Ishtar. Ishtar is the Babylonian sex goddess. Okay? Now, bear in mind that it says in Revelation 17.5 that Babylon, the whore of Babylon, is the mother of all whoredom and abominations. So God sees all of this flowing from the Babylonian Empire, this religion. So Ishtar, by the way, I'm mispronouncing that. Uh, a, a better way, a more accurate uh, translation or pronunciation that would be Easter. What? Yes. And in, in the Greek world, she was called Astarte. In Phoenicia, it was Aphrodite, but that moved into the Greek world. And Easter is literally the Anglo-Saxon goddess of Ishtar. These are all sexual goddesses, all right? That's why Easter, is a, as it's done and practiced, is a celebration of fertility. It's all about fertility. It's all about Sex. Everything about it. The bunny rabbits. The eggs. These are all... And, and by the way, in Paul's time, as he's writing this letter, all these pagan religions, they abounded with sexual symbology. Right? And, and this is why Paul... Now, how important was this? Many, if not most, virtually all of the pagan religions incorporated sexual activity as part of the religious practice. And again, Satan doesn't make appeals to the spirit, he makes appeals to the flesh, right? As Paul was writing this letter, in Thessalonica, there was a cult called Cabarrus, and that was the strongest in Thessalonica at the time. And it surely had a sexual fixation with a God who promoted fertility. The second most popular at the time he was writing this in Thessalonica was the worship of Dionysus. Now, you may have heard of Dionysus. He was a son of Zeus and the god of the grape harvest, wine-making and wine, of ritual madness and ecstasy in Greek mythology. In Roman mythology, he was called Bacchus. And that's where we get the English word bacchanal, meaning a riotous, drunken orgy. But these are all religious practices. Now, you may not see, like on television, all of the sitcoms, all of the movies, where now marriage has been become virtually non-existent, where where divorce is just commonplace and you know of no consequence, you may see that as just a thing. I'm telling you that in the spiritual realm, both God and the devil understand this to be spiritual activity, and from spiritual activity, you are either being obedient. To God Almighty, your maker, your creator, or you are being obedient in bondage as you are to the devil. Okay? The gathering of the apostles in Jerusalem. Now, if you remember this, Paul 
you can check this out in the book of Acts. Go to the 15th chapter. In the book of Acts, Paul goes back to Jerusalem. And he meets with the apostles and the elders of the church in Jerusalem. And he is sharing a testimony of all the amazing things that God is doing as he is out in the Gentile world. Right? And, and this is great. I mean, it's great what God is doing through him. But some of the Jews there in Jerusalem, in the church, are now saying, well, you know, you need to be doing, getting those Gentile believers who are coming into the body of Christ to start following the Jewish law. Something that Paul found to be an anathema. And that's, that's an abomination because we're not under the law, right? So they had what is commonly considered to be the first council. The apostles, Paul, Silas, the elders, they all come together to discuss this and pray about it and try and figure it out. Right? At the end of the day, James, who seems to be, well, James, anyhow, the apostle James, says this. This is Acts 15, 19 through 20. This is my judgment, that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled from blood. Why do you think that in this council, where they're trying to determine what instruction, what are the things that we need to tell these Gentiles coming into the church? He says, keep them away from fornication. Because that was a religious practice. Now, trust me, I, in the world that we live in, like I said, things have changed. In the mid-1800s with Karl Marx, what has happened is a religious perspective or a spiritual perspective of things has been eroded to the point where we don't have an, a spiritual appraisal of virtually anything anymore. Okay? But here's what the church is instructing new believers. Get away from these sexual activities. Why is it so important? Because it is a connection to the satanic worship. Now, when Paul leaves to go back into the field, they send a letter with him, and it says what that letter said. Again, Acts 15, 28 and 29. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than this, than these essentials, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. Farewell. There is an absolute association in the New Testament, or the Old Testament too, in Scripture, with these sexual activities and with bondage to the devil. We have become anesthetized to this. We have become complacent about it. We have become compromised about our understanding of, I mean, we are, as I say, we are inundated in our present world with all of this sexual stuff. You can't turn on the television. It, it, commercials. It, it astounds me. What I see today, it's, just, it's there. It's just constant. It's just absolutely constant. And what it is, is it's chipping away at you and chipping away at you and chipping away at you. And I want to tell you that it is the devil trying to get you to worship him. What are you going to do? Let me tell you something. This is what Paul prayed. You've got to be sanctified. You've got to be holy. You have to abstain from this impurity, sexual impurity. All right? Come out and be separate. Okay. Now, in the same light, I want to talk about something. And I told somebody, a couple of people this week, that I was going to talk about this. Mm -hmm. I find that it is absolutely, in our world today, it is more than commonplace. It is, it, it, it is virtually assumed that if you're talking to a non-believer, and unfortunately all too many believers, and they get anywhere into the issue of women's liberation, all right? Feminism, the women's lib movement. They are going to tell you, without doubt, that religion, talking about Christianity or Judaism, puts down women, persecutes women, treats women badly. Okay? That's, that is always the argument of that crap. Now, the unfortunate part is they have some basis in evidence for this because the church has been too disobedient to the word of God 
to show the truth of the Word of God. Right? Show the truth in, in action. To show the word. In 1963, little history, <clears throat> Betty Friedan wrote The Feminine Mystique. Now, I remember this. Now, you know, um, I, probably most of you are not old enough to remember this, the, the beginning of this movement. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about women's suffrage looking for the vote, which was, you know, around the turn of the century. But I'm talking about the, the, the present women's liberation movement, started with Betty Friedan. She wrote The Feminine Mystique, and, and that book is credited with starting the modern feminist movement. Now, there were very real issues indeed that should have been addressed. That's a fact, right? This led to the founding of the National Organization for Women, now, right, in 1966. Having said that, it's once again a, an issue now. They are trying to fix a spiritual problem with a natural, fleshly, and political solution. Because they don't appraise it spiritually either. And they see this as just the activity of man. They don't understand that it is the activity of the devil. All right? Do I believe in women's liberation? Absolutely I do. How could I do otherwise? Because otherwise I would be disagreeing with Jesus Christ. If you want to talk to somebody who doesn't agree with, with women's liberation, talk to somebody who's involved in the women's liberation movement. Now, because they don't understand it. The greatest advocate of women's liberation that ever walked the face of this earth is named Jesus Christ. What does liberate mean? It's a verb. It means to set free, to release from bondage. It comes from the Latin word liberare, right? That's what it means, to free from bondage. Now, Jesus, who was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor and proclaim release to the captives, says in Luke 4, 18, right? That was his, that's what he came in Luke 14, it talks about how he was teaching in a synagogue on a Sabbath when he healed. Not in, in Luke 14, it talks about his ministry, right? He's quoting from Isaiah 61. And then it, when he was teaching in a synagogue on a Sabbath, he healed a woman who had been sick for 18 years. Now, a religious official was upset because Jesus did this on the Sabbath, and he tried to ra rally the crowd to condemn Jesus for doing this on the Sabbath. Jesus answered this man, and this is what he said, and this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? Jesus liberated this woman because she was in bondage to the devil. Very good. You need to understand this, okay? The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. John 10, 10, and 11. Paul, imitating the Lord he served, respected women, contrary to what the devil would have you believe about Paul, particularly, and the word today. Thus, when Paul was first in Thessalonica, remember? Acts, Acts 17, go check it out. Acts 17, verse 4 says this. Some of them, the Jews, were being persuaded and joined Paul, Paul and Silas, along with a number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. Got it? Many of the followers of Jesus were women. Yes. Why? Because they didn't objectify or diminish women like the world and its religions. That was a woman's movement. This was. Women were attracted to the preaching of the gospel because the gospel was the first thing in a world that had no respect for women. Christ came in with revolutionary teaching and showed God's attitude towards these women. He loved them. Yes, he, did. he died for them. You know what? All these women in these movements are out there looking, they're looking for the solution in places where there is no solution. And the church is condemning them for the desire they have for freedom. They're crying out from the depths of themselves, 
for true freedom. They just don't have a clue about how to go about it. And rather than embracing them, not necessarily what they believe or their activities, but reaching out to them as Jesus did. Listen, you think for a moment that Jesus endorsed adultery? But he, could, but he went to a woman who was caught in adultery. You know what he did? He loved her. He loved her. He didn't love the sin. You know, do you know the story? I mean, all these religious people were condemning her, ready to stone her to death. Mm -hmm. They were ready to stone her to death. Where was the guy? Caught in adultery. Okay. Because that's not that's, that's, a, that's the point, is that there was this demeaning, diminishing attitude towards women. That's a fact. And that's always the way the devil works. Let me... You, I, mean, I, I don't, I don't want to get all the in there. For the brunt of it. Now, let me tell you something. How much does Satan hate women? As much as he hates men. Why? Because he hates any creation of God. No, it goes a little deeper than that. It's the bride of Christ. It's jealousy. Well, it's the bride of Christ, but it starts with the mother of God. When, uh, excuse me, slap my face. With the mother of Jesus Christ. Because he hated Mary, because she was chosen to bring forth, in the fullness of time, the promised Messiah of Israel. He's always hated women, but he hates, he hates everybody. He, listen, Satan has no love. In him. He, not only does he, he doesn't have any love, he doesn't have any like. He is the epitome of hate, right? Mm -hmm. So he hates women, and he tries to oppress, but he tries to oppress everybody. Of course he does. But he's used women. And I talk about, I'm talking about ancient times here. I have to tell you something. 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, when I started preaching, I was involved in preaching and reaching out to people in cults. I, my ministry started on the streets in New York City. There were cults around. There were cults called the Children of God out and started on the West Coast. You know how they used to recruit people? They'd send their teenage girls out to have sex with people, to draw them in. What do you think Charles Manson, do you, I mean, are any of you old enough to remember remember Charles Manson? I mean, that's what he had on this ranch. It was like free love. It ain't free love for two reasons. First of all, it's not free. Second of all, it's not love. That's right. So, I mean, it's still going on into modern times. And what do you think the devil is trying to do? Flooding the world with his sexual, just this bombardment of pornography. He's trying to get you away from the one word that matters, love. He doesn't want you to love a woman. He doesn't want you to love a woman. He wants you to use a woman. And in doing so, it is his hatred of both the man and the woman. The only one that came to set that captive free, to set the women free, was Jesus Christ. So don't, don't, don't for a moment tell me about women's liberation. If you are interested in women's liberation, go preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. I will limit because women. that's the only thing that will set people free. Let's liberate the women. The Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Right? Isn't that what it says? Where the spirit of the Lord is liberty. If the spirit of the Lord is there, not there, there is no liberty. So in verse 3, when it talks about abstaining from sexual immorality, I, my footnote for sexual says deceit. Well, you are deceived. But that's what it is. It's being it is a deceit. Yeah. And, and one of the things here, I mean, Paul is talking about morality. And again, this because I, I, I can't overemphasize this. This is not mentoring. This is discipleship. This is not a suggestion. This is a commandment of God. I want to tell you one of the reasons it's a commandment. All right? Let me go back and, and read verse 3 and start there again. This is the will of God, your sanctification, your holiness, that you abstain from the sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel. What's a vessel? Body. Well, that was what someone else is in. That's a common, this was common in, in, in the Greek world. You know, to, yes, he's talking about your body, but it's, it's more than your body. A vessel is something that is a container. 
for something. Right. Right? A container for something else. Yes, it's a container for something. Mm -hmm. It's not about you. It is about what you contain. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. You are not your own. You were purchased with a price. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. One of, this, one of the reasons this is a command is because you are not your own. You have no right to misuse what doesn't belong to you. Like and you, you doesn't belong to you. Like you spoke with about the graffiti. Yes, we're talking about was that last week we were talking yes, about the graffiti week. on the temple of God. So this is an issue of the fact that you have no right to do these things because you're not your own. We we have to get to this place. And part of the problem is when I start talking about this, you know, I wanna it's like, okay. Let's storm the castle and get Frankenstein. Get your torches and pitchforks and let's go attack the castle. See, it's not about that. I'm not trying to stir us up so we go out and start marching on someplace. No, it's about you. Let a man examine himself. It's about, you know, don't worry about the others. The, the issue here is your sanctification. The issue for me here is my sanctification. And I need to understand that this is a spiritual matter. The devil would have you think, well, it's a disconnect from the spirit. It is not a disconnect. Any impurity in your life is a spiritual act of worship of the devil. What? Read my lips. Any act of spirit of, of immorality, of sexual immorality, is an act of worship to the devil. You're, you're practicing his religion. You're practicing his religion. Get over it. Stop. Repent. Pray for the strength of God who has that power to bring you to that place of sanctification, of holiness. I, it's probably, it is, I was going to say it's probably more difficult today than it was back then. It's not. You see, they were surrounded by all this impurity. They had a culture of it that encouraged it. So do we. So do we. No. So do We're we. surrounded it. But e e even the religion encouraged it. Absolutely. And yeah. so does theirs. So does theirs. Yeah. It's a religion called humanism. Mm -hmm. And that's the exaltation of self. Well, it is. But that's why I go back and say, you know, think about this. You know, the, the, the problem is that we get complacent. The problem is... That pride mm. makes us satisfied being where we are. Humility wants to drive us on. That's why he said, you know, it's like even more. Yes, you're doing good. This is what Paul wrote to the church. You're doing good. But you strive for even more. Holiness. 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 Purity. You need more in your life. You need to be a better person, a Christian in your life. Well, I don't want to know me. No, I know me. And I know the word of God. And here's the fact, if you are not yet at that place where you are a perfect copy of Jesus Christ, then brother, you've got work to be done in your life. I don't say that for condemnation. I say that because it's a fact. And this is what we have to recognize. This is what we have to realize. This is the humility that we have to have in our lives. And you know how you get this? Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher, the perfecter of your, perfecter of your faith. Hebrews chapter 12. And when we do this, when we fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, you will, if you fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, you will realize you haven't gotten there yet. This po Apostle Paul, and who has lived a life like the Apostle Paul in the imitation of Christ? He said, not, he, 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 perfection, he hasn't achieved it yet. You're not going to achieve perfection here, but you should be striving for it. It should be the desire of your heart. It should be the passion of your life to be more and more like Jesus Christ. And thank God you're not doing this all on your own. Because he has made a promise to bring you from glory to glory to glory. To transform you. And he sent the helper. But. The Holy Spirit. Do you, you participate? Yes. It says don't be conformed to this world. This world and the world that Paul lived in was filled with impurity. Yes. So be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Jesus Christ said, be careful what you listen to. You are being attacked every day by the devil. 
Distractions. When Paul walked through, now remember, before Paul got to Corinth, on this trip, as Paul leaves, Thessalonica goes to Berea. From Berea, he goes to Athens. From Athens, he goes to Corinth. When he gets to Athens, what does it say? Now, Athens was probably the most religious city in, in, yeah. in the Roman Empire at the time. God. Everywhere, right? Yeah. And Paul says his spirit was provoked. Mm-hmm. His spirit was provoked. Now, as a result of his spirit being provoked, he didn't start going around and picking places. What he did was go out and proclaim the eternal word of God. That was his response to what he saw in Athens, was to share the word of God. That should be your response. Share the word of God. Because I don't know of anything else that can make anybody holy right. other than the word of God. That's you know why? Made. Because the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to divide. Yes. What's it able to divide? It's able to divide the flesh and the spirit in your life. But I just want, I just want it's important. Because don't, don't tolerate this lie. That, that our religion, that Christianity, is something that is in opposition to women. To the contrary, it is the most pro-woman thing there is in the world. It's Christianity as practiced by Jesus Christ and by Paul. Mm-hmm. And hopefully by me, hopefully by you. Mm-hmm. All right? Women are to be loved. Please, what is love? We know love by this. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay? It is laying down of our lives. It is giving, not taking. But again, I just want to, I want to leave this subject on this thought one more time. When you see this women's movement that I don't agree with, not in any way, I think women's liberation, the women's liberation movement, has done more to put women in bondage yes. than thousands of years of religious practices. Well, this is a movement of Satan. This one, it's the, it's the yes. opposite of God's All right. liberation. Uh, and it, it is the opposite of God's Because, you know, it says, don't lean on your own understanding. Mm-hmm. Okay? The problem is, where is the compassion in our hearts to see what the need was in these women was to be Treated with dignity, with respect, with honor. Where was that? You know, shame on us, being us, being the church, to have tolerated this all through the centuries and not stood up for our love of of women. Just remember what I said. Jesus Christ came to set the captives free, to bring freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Woman, If you want to be liberated, you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord because he is the one who came to love you with a love that only God has. Okay. Now, listen, if you reject this, if you reject what I'm saying, you're not rejecting me. Here we, oh, wait a minute. Let me, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm paraphrasing this scripture. <laughs> First Thessalonians 4, 8. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. This is not about what I think or what I'm teaching. This is about the word of God. Right? There was a lot of peer pressure back in the time of Paul. Okay, And that's why the church focused on this. They understood, and they understood what a draw sexual immorality was. Especially when it's not just condoned, but promoted by all of these pagan religions. Right? How, how dare we, how dare we take the greatest event in the history of man, and I'm talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, but I'm talking about that passage, that Pesach. From the from the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and associated with these pagan oh, goddesses yes. of sexuality, yes. how dare we do that? I don't care how much I upset you saying this, because I seek to please God and not man. The simple fact of the matter is, 
the church is so completely compromised that we take a day out of the year, one of the most important days of the year, in that Christian calendar, and worship. Worship, yes. Because you devote your attention to the goddess that the Lord God says is the mother of harlots. And you can't take something evil and make it good. No. Not from, not, this, no. Is from, this is from the no. pits of hell. God couldn't take you and clean you up and make you good. Do you know that? To be born again, you had you had to die to yourself and be born again. That's right. I mean, I I I wish we could understand this truth, but the majority of people I meet just don't get this. It's not like God took you, cleaned you up, yeah. put you in you know a nice set of clothes, and said, "Okay, now you're my kid." He killed you. That's why he said, you know, Nicodemus came to him in the dark of night and said, you know, he gets into this conversation and the Lord says to him, "You must be born again." It has to be a brand new creation. You can't put new wine in old skins. We've got it. Not, I'm, I'm not telling you to go pick at your local television station. I'm telling you to put on the whole armor of God. To stand firm against the schemes of the devil. You need to have that helmet of salvation. You need to have that breastplate of righteousness protecting your heart. This helmet to protect your mind. And thank God you've been given the mind to Christ. But we need to recognize for what, this for what it is. All right? It is a spiritual attack by the devil. When you see this, your favorite sitcom, and they treat sexual immorality as just a fun, commonplace thing, they are a, that, that is the fiery arrows of the devil who goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, trying to destroy your life, because he came to destroy it. He came to put you in bondage, to take away the freedom that Christ bought for you on that cross. That's what that's about. It's not cute. I just, just I remember years and years ago, a dear sister in the Lord, who was living with Alice and I in the, at the time. Hi, she, Susan. Hi, Susan. She, uh, had gone to, she was going to this animated movie, Disney. Who shall remain nameless? <laughs> and as she was going, I said to her, you, "You better be, you better be prayerful about watching this, okay?" And she came back after watching the movie, and I said to her, "How was the movie?" And she said it was cute, demonic, but cute. <laughs> that was that was. You want to know something? A lot of that stuff out there that's cute is demonic. Is demonic. Satan comes. Not with, with red suit and horns and a pitchfork and a tail. He comes as an angel of light. Check it out. See what Paul wrote when he wrote to the Corinthians about, the, about this old devil. How can he lure yeah. you in otherwise? Yes. He's always trying to lure you in. We are protected from the snare of the trapper. Yes. But I, you know, I've said this, and go look at Psalm 90, 91. Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody's going to set a trap for you, set it for something well, you gotta, with, yeah, with you gotta something that bait. you want, right? Yeah, you got to you got to bait a trap, right? Okay? And and the fact is, um, it's like I said, you know, if you were going to try and set a trap for me, uh, if the devil, I, work. no, no, I, if the devil's listening, yes. Oh no, don't don't try and trick me to eat asparagus. Oh no, don't come in to eat asparagus. See now he's going to use asparagus. And asparagus ain't going to draw me into the trap. Okay? He's got to find something that I, is attractive to me to draw me into the trap. The fact of the matter is that this sexual attraction that God created between Adam and Eve, his creation, is a good thing. Yeah. It is a beautiful, it's a wonderful thing. It is absolutely a God thing. That the devil has tried to hijack, pervert, and make something evil. But it works, apparently. It worked in all these pagan religions. It's working today. Sanctification. Keep your mind set on Jesus Christ. It's about religion. It's about religion. It's not just about, you know, these, these other things. Okay, I'm sorry. But do, do bear in mind what Paul is saying here, right? 
that he rejects this is not rejecting man but God. This is the instruct. This is the commandment of God. This is not. This is not godly advice. This is the commandment of God. Then he goes on here. I'm going to see if we can get this in here in verses nine and ten. Now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it towards all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. So he's saying, he's writing to the church of Thessalonica. And he's writing to the Thessalonians and saying, okay, you know about the, the love of the brethren, right? Now, I, trust me, Paul had instructed them about this. But you've been instructed by Jesus Christ, right? Remember, Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, right? They're taught by God. But we're taught first and foremost, not just by word, but in deeds, by action. I just quoted it. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 1 John 3.16. You all know John 3.16? That's 1 John 3.16. So we've been instructed by God what, what this love is. It is a love that gives totally and completely. Well, if we've been instructed that, and it's like, okay, but do it still more. And it's always this pushing. It's always this pushing to go further, to do more. And that's a good thing. All right? It's not condemnation for where you are. It is encouragement to go beyond where you are, to greater and greater places. I, I know I've shared this with you before, but I'm going to share it with you one more time. We were in Lyon in France a number of years ago, and I was teaching a Bible study to a, a group there. And all of the folks that I was teaching this Bible study were from Africa. And they were in France because, as I'm sure many of you know, a lot of people from Africa go to Europe to try and find employment because they can't find any in Africa in the parts where they are. And they need to support their families. So all these people that are at this Bible study, they're there working under not great conditions in France so they can send money back to support their families in Africa. And we're having this Bible study, and somewhere during the course of the Bible study, and I, I don't recall what brought this to, to into the conversation, but one of the brothers said to me, why doesn't the church in America, or the churches in America, why don't they do more to help? And I immediately responded, I mean, pow, you know, we don't care. That's a simple answer. No. Why don't we do why don't we do more to help? We don't care. And then, you know, it says, be slow to speak. Be quick to listen, be slow to speak. So I stopped and I repented and I gave it a little more thought and I said, okay, I, I'm going to change my answer. The answer is we don't care. Enough. Now that's a valid answer. But that night we went back to this little village we were staying in, Chesilimi. And as we did that night I was praying and I thought to myself, okay, Lord, if it's not enough, what is enough? And the words of Paul in his letter to the Philippians came to my mind in chapter 2. That we are to have the same attitude, to have the same mind in us that was in Christ Jesus. Yeah. who, not considering himself, to, you know, to have being equal with God, a thing to be grasped, he emptied himself for our sake. And there I had my answer. Jesus loved us. He emptied himself. When something is empty, guess what? There's nothing left. If you've given and given and given, and there's still something left, you haven't given enough. This is... Radical, it is revolutionary, and I recognize that. But either the Word of God is true or the Word of God is not true. Have the same mind, the same attitude in you that was in Christ Jesus. You give everything till there's nothing left. And then you've given enough. Can you give still more? Can you excel still more? Can you give still more? That's what Paul is telling the church in Thessalonica. He says, you're doing all right. You're doing good. He said, I'm pleased with you. God's pleased with you. You know what? But you know what? Excel still more. And I think that's a good place to leave tonight. Father, I thank you that you've empowered us with your own love, that you've poured the love of your Holy Spirit into our hearts. 
that you've given us the ability to love even more than we do. That you have given us a heart after your own and the mind after yourself. Lord, that we have a desire to see men set free. The only way they can be set free. By the blood your son shed on that cross of Calvary. Help us to go out and boldly proclaim that wonderful, wonderful truth to everybody that we meet. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Until next time. Is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Your word is a light into my path. Your word is a lamp into my feet. Help me.